The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, second chances and secretive prime numbers hiding behind hypotenuses squared, a marriage, a funeral, and a birthday party. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. And I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio. Christopher, we have an excellent interview with Lois McMaster Bougeau this time. Uh, she discusses her book, Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen. Oh, yeah, yeah. You let me sit in on that interview, and it's, uh, it's a good one. Uh, have you read it since then? I Did started it. I haven't it? finished it yet. <laughs> All right. It's good. Read it's it. It's been a busy week. So, Christopher, do you want to do the news this time? Absolutely. The February mass markets are now at booksellers. These include Castaway Planet by Eric Flint and Reich Spohr. This is part of the Boundary universe of Boundary, Threshold, and Portal, but it's a new subseries. It's about a group that crash lands on an alien world. Cut off from rescue, they have to figure out a way to survive. We also have a, we have a previous podcast inter- interview with um, Eric and Reich that uh, tells you all about that book. Also out is No Going Back by Mark L. Van Nain. This is the latest entry in the John Moore and Lobo series about mercenary troubleshooter John and his sardonic battle platform ship Lobo. In this one, when John risks meeting a woman from his distant past and undertakes a high-stakes mission, Lobo fears this will be their last trip together. Finally, Shattered Shields, edited by Jennifer Brozek and Brian Thomas Schmidt, is in mass market paperback format now. This is a great collection of military fantasy stories. Many of them are epic fantasy with a military edge, like Larry Correa's story in the volume. It includes stories by Correa, as well as Sarah A. Hoyt, Gray Reinhardt, Glenn Cook, Seanan McGuire, Nancy Fulda, and many others. It's good stuff. Castaway Planet by Eric Flint and Reich Spohr, No Going Back by Mark L. Van Name and Shattered Shields, edited by Jennifer Brozak and Brian Thomas Schmidt, are available now at booksellers everywhere. We are very pleased to have Lois McMaster Bujold with us. Hello, Lois. Hi, Tony. Lois McMaster Bujold is the creator of one major science fiction series and two major fantasy series, Her Vorkosigan Saga, features not only the adventures of Sion, an official troubleshooter of Interstellar Empire, Miles Vorkosigan, the once crippled and brittle bone, but now seizure-prone Miles, that is. It includes characters such as Miles' cousin Ivan Vorpatrol, who got his own book in the New York Times bestselling Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance, and Miles' mother, Cordelia Naismith Vorkosigan, who is one of the two central characters in Lois's newest Vorkosigan novel, Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen which is out now and uh, booksellers everywhere. This spring in May, to be exact, Bain is also reissuing a special 30th anniversary edition of book one in the saga, Warrior's Apprentice, with new cover art and an all-new introduction by Lois. And in December of this year, 2016, a new edition of Borders of Infinity um, will be at booksellers as well. Maybe we should uh, maybe we should just start by um, getting the title out of the way. What the heck does Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen mean? <laughs> yeah, this is actually a frequently asked question. Uh, Gentleman Joel is the troop's nickname for Admiral Oliver Joel, who is actually one of the book's two main characters, almost principal character. And the Red Queen is, is one of those lovely things that has multiple meanings, which I keep having to explain to people. It, of course, refers to Cordelia and her red hair and the fact that she's vicerine of, um, of Sergar. Uh, it refers to the uh, Lewis Carroll character, the Red Queen, <clears throat> who had to run as fast as she could to stay in the same place. And most especially, it refers to uh, the Red Queen theory uh, in biology, uh, which is uh, explained in a book by Matt Ridley, science uh, writer Matt Ridley, uh, 
who discusses, you know, why does sex exist? What does it do for us? Um, uh, why, why does it work the way it does? And the Red Queen's Race Theory in Biology um, suggests that the re one of the reasons that we have sex is to mix up our genetics because we're constantly competing not with each other and not with predators, but with uh, with parasites and, and diseases and so on, so that the human genome has to keep constantly mixing it, uh, or actually all uh, creatures' genomes have to keep constantly mixing it up to, to stay ahead in this arms race, which he dubs the Red Queen's race. So I use it as a sort of metaphor for uh, biology and reproduction gen generally, so it's a sort of a thematic statement of what this book is about. Which comes out a lot in yeah in the book. Um, by the way, I um I'm a huge fan of Matt Ridley's work, and and that's a great book. Oh, good. You can jump in at any of his. Uh, his latest is um is I think the Evolution of Everything. It just came out last year, which was a great. Well, great I'll have read. to catch up on that. Yeah. yeah. Um. Very good. So, Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen. It's not a thriller. It's not an adventure exactly, or even a mystery. Um. I mean, your Vokesuga novels are all over the place. You you use it many different forms in the in the series, which is one of the great things about this. These series. genres can I pack into one series? Let's find out. Yeah. yeah. This one is about family and love and getting older and what to do about it. Uh, the main characters, like you said, are Admiral Oliver Joel. Is it Jolie or Joel? Are we? Joel. Joel and uh, Cordelia, uh, who is Vicerine of the planet uh, Sergiar. And she's, of course, Miles Forkosigan's mother. Uh, can you explain the situation at the start of the novel? The book takes place uh, following the death of Miles' father, Errol, um, although it's been a while since that happened, right? Yeah, it's been three years, and Cordelia's starting to come up out of the fog of grief and, and trying to figure out, you know, what was I doing before I was so rudely interrupted? Where is my life now? Because yeah. this, uh, yeah, this was not the life she planned. She thought Errol would live much, much longer, and... Uh, so her, his death took her by surprise, and so now she has to like rethink her whole life and what she really wants to do. So she's kind of the prime mover of the story, and uh, and uh, the story opens with her having made some decisions and arriving back on Sergiar, and uh, and meeting Oliver Joel, whom we learn a great deal about <clears throat> as the story goes on. He's, she her decisions are sort of the 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 break in the status quo that uh, that Oliver Joel runs into, right? Yeah, yeah, she's she's the actor and she's he's the reactor even though his story is kind of the spine of the book. Yeah, his decisions about what to do and and how to do them uh are are the really the central plot of the book. That's why this opening scene begins with view, his viewpoint and the ending scene ends with his viewpoint. It's kind of like captures that even though they're both you know, co-equally important uh to events. Yeah, we're in in both of their uh, well, viewpoints. That, excuse me. We're in both of their viewpoints throughout the. It's kind of alternating. Alternating Pre viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in chapter one, she makes him a proposition that he could refuse, and uh, and has to decide what he what he's going to do about it. Um, well, who is he to her? The, and, the interview goes on. Yeah. Who is he to her? And who is he to Errol? I mean, I, I, this is not a. This, this also uh, gets explained uh, at great length in in chapter one and throughout the, the book as we sort of gradually pick up more and more pieces of backstory and put them together. Uh, but we first meet Oliver Joel back in uh, the Vor game, um, where we saw him very briefly from Miles's point of view uh, as Errol's. Uh, secretary, uh, military secretary. Errol was prime minister at this time, no longer uh, in charge of the armed forces, except <clears throat> that shifted a little later in that book. Um, and uh, and then we see him uh, again a few more times in later books. But since we're always seeing him from Miles' viewpoint, we haven't learned very much about him. But from Cordelia and Errol's viewpoint, he looms, looms much larger and more important. Ah, uh, let's see. Giving terrific spoilers for chapter one. Uh, in the first chapter, we were learned that uh, Errol and Cordelia and Joel have a long-standing, intimate, personal relationship. That uh, that Errol and Joel were lovers back in Borbar Sultana, uh, back in that uh, period where Errol, Errol was prime minister. Uh, they followed, followed a hiatus, and later he rejoined the three of them, on, or the two of them, on Sergar. 
uh, where they became a threesome at that time. Uh, Cordelia thinks this is just fine because she's Baton, and that's like normal Baton uh, personal relationships. Uh, Batons are uh, very free and easy about who sleeps with whom. They're very strict about who has children with whom. All their rules are, are about reproduction, very few about sexuality as such. So uh, it's an interesting cultural contrast with the Barrierans, uh, which Errol was, and of course Joel is too, um, who are much more uh, of a traditional patriarchal sort of culture. So a lot of the the fun of the stories right along all through have been uh, cultural conflicts uh, uh, between these, these two ways of looking at the world and doing things, you know, getting the jobs done, Differently, same jobs done differently. Can you give us a little background? The difference between the Batons and the Barriarans, or the um, what happened in the past that's that's made them so different? For instance. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is yeah. This is like the whole history of the series, world history, yeah, wow. universe history. <laughs> Batons are uh, were actually the first colony uh, colonized from uh, sublight. Actually, it was a generation ship that took 40 years to get there. So in their own word way, they were kind of a lost colony, but they were never out of touch entirely, and they kept their technology. Um, and a lot of things about their culture is covertly goes back to that 40 years all stuck together on a spaceship when they really had to be cooperative. Uh, so a lot of their emphasis on uh, psychology and social control uh, goes back to, the, to those roots. Uh, so they are a uh, Beta Colony itself is a difficult planet. It's desert, barren. Uh, they've had to like live underground and, um, and of course, keep up their technology or they would all die. Um, so they are, uh, are and consider themselves a very advanced culture. Uh, then over the course of the next few centuries, uh, wormhole travel was discovered uh, faster than light. Uh, travel completely reorganized the universe. Colonization exploded from Earth and all kinds of other planets were developed. But Beta was the first and very proud of it. Um, so Betans tend to think they're right uh, about everything. <laughs> now, Be uh, Barrier, as contrast, was uh, settled fairly early on in the, um, in the wormhole nexus uh, discovery period. Uh, but their wormhole through which they were settled was closed uh, by, a, by a kind of a space quake thing, uh, closed uh, as a natural disaster, which cut them off. Uh, so they, too, became a lost colony. But Barrier was a much more salubrious world uh, biologically, and so uh, they, they were really on the scramble, but they lost their technology and fell back to a more or less feudalistic kind of society. And when the series opens... Uh, back at Shards of Honor, which is actually the first book in the series, uh, Barrier has been, been rediscovered about <clears throat> 60 or 80 years ago and is scrambling to catch up with this 30th century galactic technology world that, uh, that they have missed. And they've undergone all this wrenching social and other changes as they scramble. Uh, so the two... Uh, this, the story starts when Errol and Cordelia meet uh, on the planet Sergar for the very first time through complicated circumstances, <laughs> and it goes from there. This is really uh, the other end of, of the beginning of the series. I should The Warriors Apprentice is book three, right? It's not book one. I don't know why I said that. Yeah, uh, Warriors Apprentice is the second book I wrote and the second book in the series. Um my uh, series order is a source of conversations and complications. <laughs> well, we have a timeline in the back of the book. Uh, yeah, that'll help you. Yeah. It can be helpful. Wrote it. This is the order it was published, but it's not the internal chronological order of the stories. So it looks like you have to work that out. But um, So if you go by the order in which I wrote them, Shards of Honor was the first and Warrior's Apprentice was the second. If you go by the internal chronology of the stories... Warriors, uh, Shards of Honor is first, uh, Barrier is second, and Warriors Apprentice is third. So both of those statements are true, but different uh, different schemes. And Jim Bain brought them out, bang, 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 right? That's part of the, the mythos of the series, because you had written them. There's three books 
Yeah, the first three books written were Shards of Honor, The Warrior's Apprentice, and Ethan of Athos. I didn't actually do Barrier to like about book eight. Um, and those three he brought out all in 1986, and uh, all of a sudden I was there. So it was a very shrewd move to get me visible very quickly. Miles says somewhere toward the end of the book that 20 years is not a fling, it's a marriage. So, um, mm-hmm. um, Errol and, um, oh. and Oliver and has, have had a thing for quite a while, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was like, you know, they, they too were making up, making it up as they went along. You know, they didn't know how this thing would go when it got started. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, uh, it stuck. But, but. Oliver and um, Cordelia really never, they weren't, they weren't in love. They were in love with the same guy, right? They weren't in love with each other They were both in love with Errol, and then Errol dropped out. It was like, uh, Errol, uh, Cordelia describes it as, as two planets circling a sun, the same sun, you know, and mm. then the sun went dark and went out, and you know, what, what happens to them next? And neither of them quite knew, and they were both, of course, <clears throat> Grief stricken and also overworked. Uh, it took him a while to kind of come together again and look each other over and say, "Okay, what's next for both of us?" Because so. uh, well, how did Errol die again? He, um, he died um, at the end of Cryoburn and of a of a uh, of an aneurysm, brain aneurysm, uh, unexpectedly, suddenly, and very frustratingly. Um, he just had a heart transplant. A decade before that Cordelia thought would be good for 50 years but, uh, but you know biology medicine is complicated stuff and, and you don't get to choose yeah. Oliver Joel is not just um, the nice guy I mean he is admiral of a fleet right he's got a big job yeah, he's an extremely competent officer he was uh, originally picked up by Errol as his secretary because he'd, he'd been a uh, space officer He'd been injured in some terrific onboard accident in which he was like, heroic and smart and got a medal, which just brought him to Errol's attention. Uh, and so he, when he was still recovering from his injuries, he got taken up as uh, as Errol's military secretary, which was like ground-based duty. Um, and uh, he was very, very good at his job. Um, he's, he's a really smart guy. He's an interesting character in that he's not a bore. He kind of represents this this class of new men that that Errol's father, Count Piotr, was complaining about back in one of the books. Um, the kind of, uh, you know, we want to bring up everybody from all classes to be in the emperor's service, and we want to promote ability, uh, not your war name or your, your family connections. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, so er, uh, Joel is very much a representative of this class of, of parole, uh, uh, lower class, middle class, Individuals not Vore, not aristocrats, uh, being brought up into the officer corps. He, Vore is sort of like Vaughn, or or it's a yeah, it's a, it's a sir. It's a title. It's aristocratic title. It, it signifies a military caste. Yeah, at, at, during the time of isolation, the Vore were a military caste. They were the soldiers, the warriors, <clears throat> the horsemen, the cavalrymen. Uh, horses being expensive bits of uh, military equipment. Uh, <clears throat> They're still sort of expected by outsiders to be able to ride horses, right? <laughs> the... yeah, yeah, so horses are a big thing on Barrier. They're a big symbol of their past, their, their glorious past, which is actually not all that glorious, but, you know, they got through somehow. How long were they isolated? About 600 years. Well, that's long enough to fall out with every. <laughs> yeah, yeah, six hundred years is long enough for a lot of things to change. <laughs> so they, they, uh, they, uh, and of course, they, the world, you know, it was wasn't as hostile as Beta Colony, but it was still plenty hostile, and they had, you know, difficulty uh, to terraform every inch of farmland because you know, the two ecologies didn't play well together. Earth, the Earth imports and the native stuff. Um, so it was a real struggle during the, the time of isolation. Did Oliver grow up uh, poor or middle class? Or he is he is a prole. He is middle class. He's from a uh, a country town somewhere in the middle of Barrier, somewhere middle western. Uh, 
he was it was not in the center of anything uh, when he was growing up and as of course as a as a smart young gr- man growing up in that kind of environment he couldn't wait to get away <laughs> and so he uh, <clears throat> he brilliated his way into the academy by uh, by whatever uh, uh you know acing the tests kind of thing that that you could do at that time plus whatever uh Whatever they were doing to you know, try to get more bright pearls in, uh, he probably had some advantages from that. So he and Cordelia have, I mean, she's she's not from an aristocratic background, right? Correct. Yeah, she too is from, Med, Med Colony is sort of relentlessly middle class. They don't really have a lower class. Nobody is poor there. Uh, it's very uh, socialized. Um Rich people are also not, you know, not as rich either. Uh, there, there's this kind of uh, middling ideal there. Uh, so she had to kind of get used to barrier and class system, of which she has a pretty low opinion, actually, <laughs> despite having benefited from marrying into the upper classes. Uh, so, she, so she and Joel sort of share that uh, that middle class. Uh, we aren't really poor approach to things this is a kind of um social it's not a comedy exactly but it's a it, it's sort of austin like in its way there's not going to be um too many uh blaster battles although blasters do come in okay. battles uh the but certainly biology and uh, ecology play a part in the story as it goes yeah. along uh sort of it's, it's a biology based story in terms of its science mm. um Hence the uh, strands of DNA on the cover. <laughs> yeah, it's characters and relationships, but characters and relationships in the pressure of changing technologies. When new technologies give you new choices about how to do things that you've never had before, how do you respond? What do you do? You know, uh, how do you how do you get your mind and life around? Uh, all these, uh, this, this strange new world that you, you find yourself in, which is very much, you know, a metaphor for our times. Because we're constantly dealing with new technology that we have to adjust to, and that is, changes, you know, totally changes the, the shapes of our lives. So it's kind of a book about that. Uh-huh. Uh, but in this case, it looks at uh, some older characters and uh, what the impact of these new biological technologies, uh, both extended lifespans and reproductive technologies could have on the choices of people, you know, who in our world would be beyond reproductive age. Yeah. Cordelia is 70-something, right? 76, yeah, at this point. Uh, in in our world, she would be, you know, she would be on her last legs, more or less, but in this world, she's just barely baiting middle-aged. And, uh, and thinking about... Uh, one of the other things the book is about, and Cordelia is about here, is that if you have an extended lifespan, how many different kinds of lives can you lead sequentially in the course of it? You know, we've been following miles through the, some of these transitions as he's gone from from a young man, uh, you know, when he was with the Dendary mercenaries and having this hotshot military career to his 30s when he was uh, having uh, having his uh, Imperial auditor career was more of a more of a detective uh, troubleshooter um, role there, uh, which is a very very different life role. And then he had to transit again when his father died, and he became Count Vercosigan. So he's been Lord Miles, Lord Vercosigan, and now Count Vercosigan three different life stages. And that's only by age forty three. But Miles lives faster than anyone else. He's very compressed. Uh, but Cordelia has this long life. She too has had. These different careers. She started out on Beta Colony. She had a good career in the Baton Astronomical Survey, and she met Errol. She had these military adventures for a while, which you know, she didn't exactly care for, but she met them. Uh, and she had the life as a as an aristocratic uh, war woman in uh, high end government. Uh, then again, uh, off to Sirgar to be Viceroy of Sirgar, which is a co appointment. Uh, so that's like four careers so far, and now she's looking looking at further ones. When when Errol died, she and Errol were the um, the kind of colonial rulers of Sergiar, right? 
Yeah, colonial governors of Surigar. It was a joint appointment. Uh, he was viceroy, she was viceroy, and then they worked as a team. And there's it's um, a smoothly. It's a it's got a population of maybe a million or or more. Is that a couple of million? It's it's yeah. very small. I mean, now really looking at the population, it's kind of like a mid-sized American Middle Western city. <laughs> being governor of or, it's less than being governor of Minnesota. It's more like being mayor of Minneapolis, but. Uh, so it's not huge, but uh, it's growing, and it's got all these complications from settling a new world with a strange ecology and biology. And we've got this the wormholes going on, which are extremely important to the Barrierans because of their traumas from the time of isolation being, uh, being shut out by the wormhole closing. So Barrierans are really, really big on guarding their wormholes. Uh, so the military is very focused on that. Is um, that's the other thing Sergar does is like hold these wormholes for the for the empire. Cordelia was one of the people who discovered this planet. Correct. Yeah, it's actually discovered twice. There was a barrier and expedition that found it first, and the barriers of that era couldn't think of anything better to do with it than use it as a staging post for an invasion of the next planet down. And Cordelia and her survey ship came along uh, when this was sort of just. Uh, being put together and discovered it independently, uh, which is how she and Errol ran across and clashed in, back in Shards of Honor. Uh, so Cordelia always sort of felt that it was her planet. Darn it, she did discover it. <laughs> what does she like it so much about it? I mean, she's she's deciding whether she's going to stay or not in this novel for, for good. It was, it was always a science geek. Cordelia was always a science geek. Her uh, specialty back in her uh, survey career was... Uh, was navigation, astro, astro mapping, um, wormhole mapping, and, and the like. But she has general science interests, uh, so uh, so that's been uh, that's been a big thing for her. Um, let's see, what was the question? <laughs> well, what is she? I mean, she had bought a uh, some property on Barriar, but she's not going to. Yeah, where, where is she going? Why? Why Sergey? Well, Sergey, you know, she she signed up to the Baden Astronomical Survey to s explore brave new worlds, and here's Sergey. It's it's a brave new world. It's right there. Let's explore it. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of uh, getting back to her science. But she likes Sergey. She likes that it's far from Vorbar Sultana. She she endured Barrier. She for the love of Errol. Uh, you know. And she endured barrier in politics, but she is so glad to be out of them. Uh -huh. yeah. Because she's Baden, and uh, part of part of the appeal yeah. is that you know, that it's not barrier yeah. anymore. It's hard to talk around the <laughs> all the central <laughs> incidents in the book. Um, Main point of the book, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's 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 about um, what you do um, when you come to a turning point in your life. Um, how you make decisions, how you're going to make that second act happen. Uh-huh. So. And, and in the context of all this, you know, this futuristic stuff, you know, how do you, how do you live your life? How do you make your choices? Um, and Cordelia throws some very unexpected choices into Joel's lap in chapter one. Um, he's kind of been on a, a upward uh, trail in the military his entire career, right? He's, what is his job at the moment? He's, he's going to be. Will he be stationed here indefinitely if he remains admiral of the fleet? Well, uh, in the in the course of the book, we find out what he does. Uh, but yeah, as, as the book opens, he's you know he's reached uh, Admiral Sir Garfield, which he considers a culmination of his career, uh, his thirty year career at that point. Um, so he had space duty originally, then he um, had. Duty with Errol as uh, you know, uh, secretary, diplomatic, all kinds of high-level government stuff, and then he had several years where he went off with the trade fleet, so he had space duty again, and this brought him around to Sergyar, uh, seasoned and ready to you know to move up in command of the Sergyar fleet, whose main job is guarding the wormholes. Uh, so so that's, he's based on Sergyar at as the as the book starts. Yeah, yeah. But he's he's at the top of of perhaps his career, but he's not at the top of the military. No, no. There's there's a bit above him. Uh, 
he's got uh, he has the enviable position of all his bosses being rather far away. <laughs> so you know, so he's got people over him. You know, he's got the the general staff. He's got you know, chief of operations. He's got a couple of other senior officers, but they're all like you know, several planets away. So in, in local space, he's he's top man. But he could be. I mean, he's subject to uh, to the vagaries of a military career. So the oh yeah, yeah the relationship has always been, and, and anything else like um, a family has always been a, something he's put on the back burner. Yes, this is correct. You know, so sort of a little like Simon Elliot, and he's kind of sacrificed his personal life to his professional public life up till now. And a little like Simon Elliot, he's reached a point where, you know, he's he's done his time uh, and it becomes possible to honorably make another choice. And Cordelia has had Miles before. That's her only child, right? Aside from Mark, I guess. Yeah, well, Mark came along a little later and unexpectedly, and that's a whole other story yeah, that we yeah. won't get into there. Yeah, but for due to a concatenation of circumstances and lots of violent barrier on politics, Miles was her only child. And one of the reasons that she married Errol in the first place, uh, speaking of the contrast between these two cultures, is that while Beta Colony is very free and easy on sexuality, they have very tight rules about reproduction. Uh, you know, so you, know, you have to pass tests, you have to like qualify, you're, you're limited, you, know, you, you don't have a lot of, you, know, you have limited choices on what you could do. Barrier was wide open, she could have as many kids as she wanted with Errol, and that was attractive to her at, uh, at age 34. And that got derailed, of course, uh, by uh, Errol being appointed regent for uh, young Emperor Gregor and their whole lives being swallowed up uh, by by barrier and politics. So this, this too, like her science survey career, was something that she lost 40 years ago. And she's sort of saying, I could recover this. You know, I, could, I could have a do-over. Yeah. And she, I mean, and, and also, she just had to devote so much time to Miles when he was younger because he was, oh, yeah. he was born he was handicapped. Uh, yeah, and then hyperactive and bent and occult in every way. And, you know, it's amazing that Cordelia emerged from that anywhere near sane. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. So, so they I'll, both, uh, Gentleman Joel <laughs> has done a lot and he's he's accomplished a lot and he's heroic. Uh, and he's he's at a place where maybe it's, um, it, but he's he's never made it, had a, a real family, and uh, Cordelia has thought about this possibility of, uh, so not to have any spoilers, but that's what the book's about, <laughs> basically. Yeah, uh. so she, you know, there, there is a romance subplot, but it's actually the subplot. You know, the yeah, yeah. The she makes him is, you know, here is this technological reproductive opportunity. Would you like to take it? Mm -hmm. And it's like, thinks it through. It's like, you know, that would completely change my life. Do I want to do this or not? Uh, can I bring these people that I'm offered into existence? Or, you know, do I abandon the idea? Do I follow my career? Do I make changes? It's uh, one of the re early reviewers for uh, for the book made the remark that uh, that what Joel is going through is very much that kind of up and out decision that military officers have to make at a certain point in their careers. You know, how do you, if you're going to go back to civilian life, how do you make the transition back? And what will you be when you are, you know, stepping out of this this world, organized world that you've been in for so long, and into a world where there's uh, far more freedom, but also more choices that have to be made. Um, and it's it's a challenge, you know, at uh, at all levels. And Miles shows up. He's in the book. He comes uh, about midway in um, and proceeds to be Miles, right? Uh, yeah, we kind of give that away on the Jack Flap at cop, Jack Flap copy, so that's not really a spoiler. But uh, but yeah, yeah, he's he's also had this you know, and now Mother is going to do this totally unexpected thing that I wasn't prepared for, and he has to, like bash in and see what the heck is really going on, and everything is okay. And there <clears throat> follows a really interesting, really subtle bit of arm wrestling between. Really, it's between. Uh, Oliver Joel and, and Miles Verkosigan for the possession of the future of Cordelia, 
for Corsican. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, so that's that's a lot of fun to follow in the in the course of the book as they maneuver around each other and you know um, it's. Yeah, Miles at one point Cordelia says, "Love, because- uh, did you, did you um, give him the your intentions better be honorable speech?" And Miles is like, <laughs> "I think much. that's part of what was going on there." Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's it's sort of like two porcupines making love because they're both very powerful men and they both sort of are holding the same hostage. And so they have to be very careful with each other. Both of them are trained, you know, Oliver's trained in diplomacy, and Miles has learned it <laughs> the hard way. Uh, so uh, so it was a lot of fun writing their conversations and interactions because there's so much subtext. Mm-hmm. There's, I mean, the whole, there's the, the dialogue in this book and the, the, the interactions between the characters provide so much um, it, Delicious stuff, I guess you could say. It's um. Mm-hmm. It was. I was enjoying it. It's really fun. And I hope the, those readers who share my taste will also enjoy it. And I mean, as usual, it's just um, it's it, every page has something interesting and delightful on it with um, just the way that, that uh, an interesting thought by one of the characters that, or um, or something that's funny in context that or hilarious in context. And by the way, what is boot polo? What, this comes into the Polo, uh, climax. Yeah. The Polo turns up as a kind of an incident toward the end of the book. It's it's basically it's barrier on military Calvin ball. Um, it's a a game that was devised by the grunts, the foot soldiers, back in the time of isolation, when the officers were all playing cavalry with their horses. And of course, the grunts have no horses. They just get to clean up after the horses. So they devised their own uh, own game. Um, Sort of vaguely modeled on on polo, but with the you know, rules that they made up as they went along, and so it's become, uh, as these things do, a, a barrier in military tradition. Uh, it uh, has the peculiarity of having three sides with three goals that shift around in, in the course of the game, uh, which has some very odd effects on the on the strategy of the thing. Uh, so we we have a we have a boot polo game in the course of the book. It's kind of fun to write. Yeah, Joel is coming up on his fiftieth birthday, and and that this is sort of the climax of um, of everything as well, um, a celebration or not. Um, <laughs> very much like a you know a, a, but, but, yeah. the book of um, in the tradition of, of, of not romances, but uh, you know like. I don't know how you characterize them, social comedies. and It's, uh, it's sort of in the tradition of Miles' dinner party, actually, is yeah. <laughs> what it's in the tradition of. <laughs> Only not quite as disastrous as it comes at the end of the book and not in the middle. <laughs> so the, it seems to me that writing about how people deal with the, the this middle point in their lives is at the heart of the book. And, and you have passed your 29th birthday recently, um, mm-hmm. Did you perhaps want to um, explore these kind of, of issues that you it, it was something that you hadn't maybe had the, been able to write about before or wanted to? Yeah, well, there's certainly you know there's certainly life knowledge that comes uh, you know from from arriving at this stage and discovering you know discovering these viewpoints that you really hadn't seen before. There's something peculiar about the way. Older characters are written in fiction. Um, it's a little bit like the way some writers can't write characters of the opposite gender because they can't imagine, really imagine what's going on in their heads. Um, and so they fall back on stereotypes. There are a lot of stereotyped grown-ups in fiction, uh, particularly young adult fiction, but others, others as well. I wanted to, you know, to switch viewpoints and you know, get inside the heads of older people and, and the way they think, uh, the way they perceive time, the way they perceive opportunity and chance. Uh, all those things shift as you get older. I wanted to play around with that. The way they perceive getting it on. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole different attitude to everything. I wanted to, I wanted to. Give Cordelia my full knowledge of you know, everything I know about being older. Uh, that you, know, you kind of have to hold back for a younger character because oh, they they won't have learned that yet. You know, leave that out. Uh, so so it allowed me to stretch myself as a writer, I guess, um, and Joel as well. 
so uh, so that was fun. Well, what do you um? You keep saying you'll see what happens next, and we know you're somewhat retired. Uh, but uh, are you working on something? Do you what? What are you thinking about? Anything for Kosigan ask? Once I've done six email interviews, so that's pretty much burned up my writing time and energy. <laughs> uh, I did a lot of uh, sort of life maintenance and career maintenance stuff that uh, that has been brought to me. That uh, what happens when you have a twenty six book backlist to take care of. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I have, um, sworn off, uh, writing books to contract. Uh, so no more deadlines, you know, no more promises. So whatever I write, I will write on spec and only mention it after the first draft is bagged. Uh, and that way, you know, there will be no confusion and <laughs> no, no broken promises and, and, uh, and so on. But people, people assume, they assume that you're always going to be writing the next book, yeah. It's, uh, I guess the writers have got them all trained after years and years of writing series. Well, do you feel a, a certain, uh, do you feel a certain obligation or do you say, man, I can't do it that way. That's just not, the, that's going to rule my life. I can't have the, the giant pressure of all those readers. To, to a great extent, getting older has been a, a process of repossessing my own time that had formerly, you know, been chopped up and given away in pieces in, uh, in all these different directions, including to my career. So repossessing my own time and my own choices, um, which turns out involves saying no to a lot of nice people who like me, but um, to learn to do that. But yeah, I, yeah, I will probably still write. Um, it'll be one project at a time, and I don't have an overarching plan that I have to stick to. It's, it's very freeform. Now, this may turn into just me becoming a puddle in the middle of the floor. We'll find out. <laughs> or, you know, I may get bored and plunk up and, and come up with something new. Well, you've done it twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, so far it's working. You know, as retirements go, it's, it's been not bad. Yeah. That seems rather Cordelia-like, this, this attitude. <laughs> yeah, damn it, I'm doing it my way now. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of that going on. <laughs> Well, um, what else can we say about the book that would be non-spoiler, that, but that, that would be intriguing? Uh, I don't know. It depends on the readership. Uh, you know, if uh, I, I have, uh, I put warnings on my blog, and I should probably warn again. You know, that if you think this is going to be a miles-like action adventure novel, no, you know, don't plunge into it. You know, waiting for the ninjas to burst through the windows because they never do, and you'll shoot right off the end of the book without having, you know, without having paid any attention to the story that's actually in front of you. Uh, so so that's a, a reading protocol problem that I would like to head off at the past. Yeah. Uh, improper expectations for what kind of book this is going to be. Yeah. And if you've read, if you've read the that, series, you know that, I mean, if, if readers read the series, their reader knows that, that you do all kinds of different. Uh, yeah, but this is a little bit more different than usual. You know. um, mm -hmm. What are the things about this book, and I did try at the beginning to think up, you know, some kind of action plot to go in it, and nothing, nothing would go, you know, is that uh, one of the things action plots depend on is villains. This book has no villains. You know, it's not about that kind of thing. Uh, villains are, you know, I'm kind of bored by villains at the moment, actually. They they frequently make no sense, uh, economic or otherwise. <laughs> it's like, what are these people thinking? Um and they, they, they're kind of like red shirts. You, know, you call them into existence just so you can destroy them again. Um, and that seems like a sort of circular waste of time. And, and other things to do with this story. There are some subplots in it as well. There, there's a, uh, an interesting uh, encounter between a, a Varyarian officer and, uh, and uh, Set again. I guess. How do you say that? Sita Gandon. Yeah, Sita Gandon diplomat. Yeah. yeah. That was kind of fun to play with. And Sita Gandon comes in uh, to the, not to the story necessarily, but we hear, I mean, well, it does in the subplot. Um, Sita Gandon is another, um, a third empire uh, of sorts, right? That um, is, is very much uh, biologically modify, modification based and such. Oh uh, yeah, there's there's a moment there when we are reminded that the Cetagandas are out there and they are very very dangerous people, um, and they haven't gone away. 
Uh, and I think they're better than every one. That's fair. That's... <laughs> There's a lot of that going around. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, well, they're kind of, I mean, in a way, they're the villains in, in my mind of the book because it's like, you know, this, we have to resolve this so that when but, they come back. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, it's life goes on everywhere. You know, everybody's muddling through. Um, so they're, they're there, but uh, they're not. The there's, of this book. there's also a, a nice subplot right. of what do military, uh, what do you what do you do if you're a single parent with a kid and that's a teenager and you know. yeah yeah we have uh, uh, General Fyodor Haynes as as a worked example of that yeah here's here's a military officer who is who is at the moment a single parent because his wife sent his daughter out uh, to barrier while she uh, to Sergio while she stayed back on barrier to deal with some other family matters. And so he's like living with this teenager and tearing his hair out. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And it gives, I mean, it gives. So much angst, I can't help it. You know, I can't deal with this. But, uh, and she does get in some, uh, in, in a bit of a mess. And, and it gives Joel and uh, it, it, Oliver and Cordelia a glimpse of what may be coming if they make certain decisions. Yeah, pretty. Freddie Haynes is kind of a, a warning. <laughs> so you, it could be like this. Yeah. Freddie Haynes is also a pretty cool character in her own right. I really like her. She's she's young and feckless, but damn it, her heart's in the right place. So, yeah. uh, so I quite enjoyed her her little scenelets uh, over the course of the book as she dips in and out of the plot. Well, the Vorkosigan saga continues, um, and... Uh, the book is Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen by Lois McMaster Bujold. It's now at booksellers everywhere. Lois, thanks so much for talking with us about this. Thanks for inviting me. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Okay, Fredette said, shaking his head and listening to the take from the captains. The increasing number of boat captains in the flotilla gossiped like old women on various frequencies, which made keeping up with the goings-on of the group easy. This guy's flipping insane, Diving into a feeding frenzy to release a boat and then taking out a shark with a pistol? If it's crazy and it works, it ain't crazy, Bundy said, shrugging and making a note. Note to Sonar, the weird transient was the sound of a forty-five being fired sixty feet underwater. Don't forget the whole into a shark part, Fredette said. That probably changes the acoustics from just firing it. Good point. Galloway raised an eyebrow and looked at Commander Freeman. His own subordinate skippers call him Captain Insanity, sir, Freeman said defensively. Not to influence the discussion or anything, Bryce said, holding up her hands. But I'm starting to like this guy. Freeman looked at his monitors and sighed. Sir, we may have a destabilizing element in the equation. Which is? Galloway asked. Passive sonar in the Dallas indicates an approaching Russian typhoon. They're sending a boomer? Bryce said, blinking. A boomer? Their fast attacks are not as well designed for long endurance as ours, Freeman said. It's possible that they don't have a fast attack to close the position. Acoustics indicate it's probably the Servestal. Sounds like time to talk to Sergey again, Galloway said, grimacing. Slippery, Steve said as he jumped off the dinghy onto the boarding platform. The dinghy was going up and down in five-foot regular seas 
whereas the boarding platform was hardly moving. He'd done it so many times, he really didn't notice. Watch your step. He'd actually landed on the chest of one of the dead infected. He also didn't really notice that, except one detail. Is it just me, or is there a preponderance of women? He asked, catching the line thrown to him. We'd noticed that, Fontana said. And for all they were zombies, kind of pretty ones. Men, Faith said, stepping easily onto the flush deck. Da, this is one of the easiest boardings we've ever done. Noticed, Steve said. But if you slip overboard, it will go quickly to one of the worst, he added, pointing to the still circling sharks. So, you seriously shot a hammerhead with a forty-five? Fontana said, taking point. There were stairs up to the promenade deck to either side of the landing. He took port, just because. There also appeared to be some sort of pop-out door, but there were no obvious external controls. Wasn't my first option, Steve said, as Faith took starboard, and I'm not sure whether to trust the gun again. We need to be really careful on fire discipline on this one. I think it's going to be as bad as the cutter. Well, it's got all the usual zombie mess, Fontana said, looking over at Faith. Oh, look, there's movement to my starboard. Very effing funny, Falcon, Faith said. She looked through the heavy glass doors at the interior and shrugged. I don't know, a little paint, some carpet? A lot of carpet, Steve said. I think we need to start clearing freighters to look for carpet. What appeared to be the main saloon was about 60 feet long, two stories high, and had once been a vision in fine wood bars, tables, and white carpet, and equally white sofas and chairs. There were also plasma screens freaking everywhere. From the looks of it, some of the windows could double as smart screens. The central bar was a vision of cream, silver, and blonde wood, with Social Alpha emblazoned above, along with what appeared to be the logo for Spacebook, the social networking site. Someone had defaced it, apparently tried to strip off the platinum, and since it was above most of the damage, that had probably been an uninfected human. Half the plasmas were obviously trashed, the floor was covered in the usual mix of blood, decomposing flesh, and feces. So were the sofas, chairs, tables, and the fine wood bars. There were bullet holes in half the windows. There were at least nine chewed corpses in view. All the booze is gone, Fontana said, looking behind the central bars. Maybe they figured out how to break the top of a bottle, Faith said, stepping gingerly around the central bar to starboard and sweeping from side to side. The room had no interior light, but they were still getting good radiance from the tinted windows. She checked behind the bar on her side, leading with her saiga. Cleaning this up is going to be a bitch and a half, but I think it might be worth it. The problem is, again, fuel, Steve said. There's that small tanker Sophia found, Fontana said, sweeping to port again. Let's say I'm a little uncomfortable clearing a tanker. Steve said, hefting his saiga, especially one that has been sitting without spices being vented. All I can see is Faith shooting a zombie and the whole thing going boom. Then there's the problem of getting it running and getting the fuel from it to the other boats, in mid-ocean. All problems we're going to have to figure out, Faith pointed out. We're going to need the fuel, now or later. Open hatch to the interior, Fontana said, pausing. The scattered bars were designed to get people to flow in a free-form manner. They also tended to restrict line of sight, which he wasn't enjoying. Ollie, ollie, oxen free, Faith shouted. Zombies, zombies, any zombies home? I wonder how far that actually carried, Steve asked. Far enough, Fontana said, as the laser dropped onto a zombie's chest. Wait, Faith said delightedly. Why, Fontana asked. The zombie was in pretty bad shape, and it wasn't closing fast, but it wasn't like he wanted him to get to melee range. Oh my god, Faith squealed as the zombie charged. Do you know who that is? No, Steve said, still covering the rear. You going to shoot a Fontana? Mike Mickerberg, she said, 
pulling the trigger on the Saiga 12 gauge. The former internet billionaire was splattered all over the deck of his mega yacht. Clean up on aisle nine. That's getting old, Faith, Steve said. And who? The guy who invented Spacebook, duh. Well, even if we had the equipment, we couldn't use him for vaccine, Fontana said. Why? She asked, heading to the next hatch. He'd infect people with horrible apps? Actually, I was wondering if he had a spine, Fontana said, then looked down. Yep, sure does. Amazing. Don't step in him, da, Faith said. You might get slime-lined. Hello? Any zombies in there? Zombies. Zombies. Ali Ali oxen free. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Christopher Rocchio, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz, and a blossoming planet gone wild with nanobots that have transformed the place into a gigantic mum for the Universal Senior Prom, and a twinkling scatter of stars blinking thank you in a billion-year cry of gratitude to Lois McMaster Bujold, author of Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. Keep reaching for the stars. Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama.